I would like to thank our sponsors, the Boatwright Foundation, Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, Mascoma Savings Bank, Norwich Square Properties, and, the, and Jane W. Stetson and E. William Stetson III. Um, doing the formal introduction of tonight's speaker is Peter Gilbert, who is the Executive Director of the Vermont Communities Council. So please join me in welcoming Peter Gilbert. Well, thank you, and thank you for being here this evening. I'm, I'm grateful to Lucinda for uh, making those uh, thank yous on behalf of the Vermont Humanities Council, as well as the uh, Library and the Historical Society. I want to add one more, and that's to Lucinda, who came here two hours early, earlier to turn the heat up in here. And so we're most grateful for her. On the other hand, we know it's cold out there, and the ceiling is high, so uh, that's where we are. But we're glad you're here, and I'm glad you uh, are dressed properly, as the British would say. Uh, we've been looking forward to this talk uh, a long time. Colin Calloway is uh, uh, a terrific uh, professor at Dartmouth. He received his uh, BA and PhD from the University of Leeds. He has taught at the uh, 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 University of St. John in England. He has served as the editor and assistant director of the Darcy McNichol Center for the History of American Indians at the Newbury Library in Chicago. He joined the faculty at Dartmouth College in 1995 and has served four consecutive three-year terms as chair of the Native American Studies program. He is now the uh, John Kimball Jr. 1943 Professor of History and Professor of Native American Studies. He's the author of about a dozen books, depending on how you count them, uh, and as well as the editor of uh, a good number of others. Uh, his books include uh, some of the following, including the following, Pen and Ink Witchcraft, Treaties and Treaty Making in American Indian History, The Scratch of a Pen, 1763 and the Transformation of North America, one Vast Winter Count, The Native American West Before Lewis and Clark, The American Revolution in Indian Country, which was nominated for the Pulitzer and other awards. His next book is the subject uh, of his talk this evening. It's entitled The Indian World of George Washington, First Americans, the First President, and the Birth of the Nation. It will be out. April 2nd, just in three months. Um, he has received awards from the Missisquoi Nation of Abenakis and the Native American Students of Dartmouth. He was the American Indian History Lifetime Achievement Award recipient in 2011. And in 2014, he was awarded an honorary degree from the University of Lucerne, Switzerland. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you all for coming out on a cold night. I appreciate your attendance, even if I question your judgment. Um, there's a kind of Pavlovian response anytime men anyone mentions that Pulitzer Prize thing. I have to share this with you. You'll like it. When I heard that I'd been nominated for a prize, I called home, right? Tell my wife. I'd been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Silence. What? You? <laughs> so, <clears throat> every time I tell that, you know, I, I, the women tend to laugh and the guys, yeah, no, 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 no. So, a couple of things, first of all, um, as consolation for turning out tonight, if you waited until April, you'd have to, have to wait through 600 pages. Tonight, I'll try and do it in 60 minutes, uh, so you get the highlights. Um, but the other thing I want to make clear is that this, the reason I wanted to write a book about Native Americans and George Washington was because George Washington is such a fundamentally important, iconic figure in American history. And I thought if I can show that Native Americans were important in his life, shaping his life and the nation that he created, that's a good way of demonstrating that Native Americans are important in the history 
of the early American Republic. So even though I'm British, and even though I'm talking about Native Americans, the, the, the purpose is not to debunk or trash George Washington. Um, <clears throat> obviously, there will be things in there that where one could be critical of George Washington, but there also I also have actually, in many ways, tremendous developed tremendous admiration for George Washington. And I just wanted to show you something that I, I brought tonight. This is the <clears throat> acts passed by the first Congress of the United States, 1789. And the first of which is the, Declar is the uh, Constitution. Right? And this is George Washington's copy. I spent uh, the fall of 2016 down at the National Library for the study of George Washington. And one of their most recent acquisitions was this. And it cost them $8.9 million. Right? And they don't know I've got it, but you know. So, so, yeah. But what I think to me represents or causes me great admiration from Washington is this. You can't see it from here, from where you are. But in his copy of the Constitution, in thin pencil next to certain clauses, is the word president. He went through the Constitution marking for himself, flagging what his duties, responsibilities were as president of the United States. And with every passing tweet, I just think, you know, <laughs> you know where I'm going with that, right? So. Because Washington was aware that he was first president, and he was aware that he, anything he did, he was establishing precedent. And he knew how to spell both of those words. <laughs> and he said to the select board in, Bo in Boston in 1795, everything I do, I am guided by the Constitution. Right? In fact, <clears throat> a lot of what Washington did had far more influence in shaping American history and American Indian policy than did the Constitution. But he was uh, quite clear that he felt constrained by the Constitution and that that was his, his model. Um, I'm going to stand here because it's easier for me to, to, to do this. Um, I've, I've got a lot of slides to show you. Uh, I'll have questions at the end, but if you have questions or anything you want to uh, ask while we're going through, feel free to do that. You're not going to interrupt a long train of thought, uh, as one of my students put on an evaluation. Professor Calloway doesn't lecture, he just makes things up as he goes along, <laughs> which, is, which is the, that's the impression you want to create. Right? <laughs> But Washington is an iconic figure, right? Even his house is iconic. I was at, somebody who was down at the library when I was there was doing a study of houses and she said they're all over the place. Even Howard Johnson apparently were modeled on this. That there are Mount Vernons everywhere. So it's the importance of Washington as <clears throat> in American history that attracted me to him as a vehicle for better understanding the role of Native Americans in shaping this country and in the man who, who made it. So begin with a story, um, a couple of stories. Feb Monday, February the 4th, <coughs> 1793, Washington sits down to dinner. It's a formal dinner at his house on Market Street, Pennsylvania, <coughs> uh, in Philadelphia. He tended to eat dinner at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and it was a big deal. And Jefferson was there, <coughs> Henry Knox, Secretary of War was there, the other cabinet members, and a delegation of Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Indians. The following Monday, <coughs> February 11th, same deal. Dinner with the cabinet and a delegation of Native Americans, this time from the Ohio, Illinois country, what was then the West. In December 1796, John Adams, in his diary, mentions that the week previously, that is the last week of November 1796, the president, George Washington, had dinner on four different days with four different delegations of Indians. Right? And when he 
had dinner with them. He also smoked Calumet with them. There was exchange of wampum belts, etc. This is a very different image of George Washington and that stiff, formal figure that we're so used to. <clears throat> and these were not necessarily unwanted guests. A lot of these people were there at Washington's invitation. And you might think, well, of course they were, because he wanted their land. Right? Washington made it quite clear to Henry Knox, <clears throat> he said, tell the interpreters and anybody else who's talking to the Indians, don't mention land. Right? Because of course that's what he was after, and they knew that. But the reason they were there in the 1790s was not so much about land, but because the United States was still this <clears throat> kind of embryonic republic, very precarious. It was only a couple of years, in some cases, after the Constitution. The British were in Canada, the Spaniards were in the Southwest, and powerful Indian nations hemmed in the United States. Washington <clears throat> dined with Indians regularly, not because he liked Indians, but because he understood the importance of Indian nations to the new nation that he was building. When the United States is created, it needs to make a place for itself, <clears throat> as I said, among the powers of the earth. So the United States looks east to Europe and alliance with nations there, and west to ally with the nations of North America, and those are Indian nations. Washington knew that. History, I think, has forgotten what Washington knew. So this is a an image taken from a, a book of sketches of Philadelphia published in 1800. <clears throat> so this is what was going on in the 1790s. Sketch of Philadelphia with a group of people, and they are Native Americans. Okay? And there are a number of these sketches show this. Indian delegations were such a regular feature <clears throat> to Philadelphia that on one occasion, because they used to take them out to tour the sites, they took them to Peel's Museum, which was a big deal, and a delegation of Indians from the north, from the Ohio country in Illinois, bumped into a delegation of Indians from the south, Cherokees, Chickasaws, Creeks, and Choctaws. Right? Could have been a bloodbath. It was just socially awkward, I guess, for a while, but this was a a common occurrence. So I want to look at the roots of that and what was going on when all of this happened. <clears throat> and begin by looking at Washington's early career in the Ohio country. Because it is about land. Before I started doing this, uh, this book, I read a lot of biographies of George Washington, most of whom, most of which, said very little about Native Americans. Right? But if you went through those biographies and every time it used land or Western land, you crossed out Western and put Indian, then the books were all about Indians. Right? Because, let's face it, the United States is a nation built on Indian land. Right? This is not a, a revisionist interpretation, it's just the way it is. Right? And Washington was instrumental in that, and Washington spent his life literally obsessed with land, obsessed with Western land, obsessed with getting Indian land. Not only um, acquiring land from Indians by whatever means necessary, but also acquiring land from former comrades in arms who also were entitled to the same land bounties that he wanted. He was pretty unscrupulous in, in his tactics. And by the time he died, he owned 45,000 acres of Western land. Right? And I've looked at his will, and it's like 29 pages, and he goes through these different land holdings piece by piece. Uh, he always complained that he was land rich and cash poor, but he was one of the richest men in America. So for Washington, Western land, Indian land, was a path to personal fortune. But it was also a path to power and prosperity for his state or colony of Virginia, 
I just lifted this from the Virginia Taurus board, which you can kind of just see it, right? Because Virginia looks west. Virginia was a leading colony state in American expansion because it pushed into, across the Appalachians into West Virginia, Kentucky, Ohio. Right. Take a look at this map. This is a 1755 British map. And look at Virginia's land claims there. Right. A number of the original 13 colonies chartered by the Crown received land grants by the Crown, from the Crown, which were pretty expansive and said things like, to the Western Sea, that would be the Pacific. <laughs> Nobody knew where it was, but that's where it was. Yeah, those were the claims. So Virginia felt that it had claims to a huge amount of what was now Pennsylvania, Ohio country, etc. And Virginia and Pennsylvania were in contest for a lot of those things. So Washington is out for this land, Virginia is out for this land, and then of course when the United States is created as a nation, it's fundamental and essential to not only the future and the growth of the nation, but even to its survival that it acquire land. Washington spends his life thinking about, writing about, speculating, surveying, swindling people out of land. This is the core of his life. The problem is, of course, that in the middle of the 18th century, the land that he wants and that Virginia wants, lots of other people want. And particularly in what is the Ohio country, it's a hotly contested region between the two superpowers of Europe, Britain and France. It's also contested between different Indian nations who are the people who effectively control, dominate life on the ground. But this map sort of shows <coughs> how it looks, or how at least it looked on paper. Of course, this is a map that, like so many maps, is <coughs> a European fantasy. Right? Huge French empire. Right? It's like six French soldiers and two guns. Right? <laughs> It's Indian country. That French empire rests on the fur trade and it rests on a network of alliances with Indian people. Right? The French understood that. The British not so much because they felt they were hemmed in by this French power, but it was actually a house of cards. And for Washington and Virginia and the British to gain access to that territory, they had to dismantle that set of alliances. And Washington found himself thrown into the mix of that, which is where he kind of cut his teeth, where he learned the business of, or well, learned how to do business in Indian country, uh, and where he earned a reputation, whether deserved or not. This is the first portrait that we know of Washington, done in later life, it's about 40, but he has himself painted wearing his um, officer's uniform from the colonial militia, recalling the days as a young man where he made a name for himself in the Ohio country. And it started when the governor of Virginia sent him on a mission in 1753. He was 20, 21, right? It's like the age of one of my students, Dartmouth. <laughs> <coughs> like, like sending Jared Kushner to sort out the Middle East, right? Um, his governor of Virginia sent him and said, go and take this message to the French who were building a string of forts in the Ohio country. And the message was a letter politely requesting that they withdraw. Right? These are British, right? Would you mind awfully going away? Right? <laughs> of course, the French said thanks, but no thanks. And partly what Washington was doing was gathering information. When he came back, Governor of Virginia asked him, said, write up your report. So he did it overnight. Again, I'm reminded of my students at Dartmouth, right? You do it the night before it's due. And that was published and printed and published not only in Virginia, but in Britain as well. So suddenly this kid becomes quite well known. Then the governor of Virginia sends him back with a force of colonial militia, 
to oppose the French who were there. And that's where it gets interesting. In biographies of Washington, there's a, there's a skirmish right, in which a French officer called uh, Sieur de Jumonville is killed along with 10 or so French soldiers. Washington, who's usually very meticulous in talking about his own actions, is very succinct on this one. Basically, it just says, we opened fire and 10 French soldiers were, were killed. Right? If you know anything about 18th century muskets, if you open fire and 10 soldiers are killed and a couple are wounded, that doesn't add up. Something else was going on. And the other thing that was going on was the Indians who were there. Washington teamed up with a Seneca Indian by the name of Tanarison. This is not him, but it's a modern artist's uh, representation of the kind of person Tanarison was. Right? Washington was 21, this guy was probably in his 50s, late 40s, 50s. Tattooed, wounded, had made a name for himself as a warrior, was now a statesman. This would have been an impressive individual. And I think from reading the evidence that he played Washington like a harp or a drum. Washington, it's often said, fired the, the shot that sparked the Seven Years' War, the First World War. This is the guy that did it. For reasons that I can go into later if you want, uh, he was, it was in his interest to push England and France into war, to bolster his own faltering prestige. And what happened in that skirmish was quite clear, Washington lost control of the situation. The Indians took control of the situation, and this guy sank his hatchet into the head of the French officer. Right? He actually then, according to one account, washed his head, hands in his brains, and said, thou art not dead yet, my father. Right? the ritual language of diplomacy, throwing off the French alliance, the alliance of the French, um, and then immediately sent wampum belts and hatchets to other tribes to say we're at war with France. Washington, this young man, was totally out of, of his element. Right? Subsequently, a French force to avenge that skirmish compels Washington to surrender at a place called Fort Necessity. And in that surrender, written in French, the terms of the surrender, Washington admits to the assassination, essentially the murder of this French officer. Right? Gave the French a huge propaganda tool. As a result of that mismanagement, that bungling of affairs out there, the British then promptly sent to North America the biggest army it had ever sent under a commander by the name of General Edward Braddock with <clears throat> directions to take this army to blaze a path across the Appalachians out to what is now Pittsburgh to seize the, fort, uh, the forks of the Ohio, demolish the French fort there and build a British fort. Washington went along on that expedition. Um, even though he was in terrible shape, he was suffering from dysentery, uh, piles, all kinds of things. He actually had to ride on cushions. Right? <clears throat> but he was there when the British Army collided with a force of French and primarily Indian warriors and was routed. Right? This was a huge defeat for the British. But it again reinforces the limits of imperial <clears throat> empire and ambition in a world where Indians called the shots, literally, and controlled what, what happened. So Washington's early career as a military leader and, a, if you like, a diplomat in the West, in the Ohio country, <clears throat> amounts to an unsuccessful diplomatic mission, a dubious uh, encounter with the French, a shameful surrender at Fort Necessity, and then being present at an unprecedented military disaster. And he became famous. <laughs> it's like, the worse he did, the better people liked it. Right? 
in part that was because <coughs> he, his name kept coming to the fore. Right? At Braddock's defeat, he clearly showed tremendous courage. Right? He's said to have had horses shot from under him. Of all, all of the officers were wounded except him, <coughs> which some people said that he'd, he'd been marked by providence for greater things. But he emerged out of all of this as somebody with a reputation in Indian country and a reputation on the frontier. So that when the American Revolution broke out, he was the go-to guy who would be able to unite the colonies because he had a vision larger than, than Virginia. And I want to just sort of back that up a little bit to talk about <coughs> the American Revolution and the role of Indian country in that. So when the British get their act together and kind of reboot their war effort in the revolution, they turn it around. They begin to win victories against the French. They begin to win Indian allies from the French to the British. And by 1763, the Brits have not only defeated the French in North America, they've defeated the French all around the world. And at the Peace of Paris in 1763, France cedes its empire. Everything west of the Mississippi goes to Spain, basically to keep it out of the hands of the British. Everything east of the Mississippi goes to the British. So the British have won this enormous empire, which they now have to administer. And they don't know what the heck to do with it. And they don't have any money. The British nation is virtually bankrupt at the end of the longest war that it's ever fought, a world war that lasted eight, eight years. When the British take over, the first thing they do is, make, is break the promises that they'd made to Indian people to seduce them in the 18th century, term of the word, from the French. When Indian people fought in these colonial wars, they were not fighting as pawns of the French. They were not uh, fickle in the sense that Europeans called them. They were quite consistent in why they, what they were fighting for. They were fighting to preserve their independence and to defend their homelands. And so they sided or fought against the side which seemed to offer the best opportunity to secure those goals or seemed the greatest threat. The British won the Indians from the French by saying, when we've kicked the French out, your homelands will be safe. The British then promptly occupied the forts the French had occupied, ran up the Union Jack, and to compound the problems of what seemed to be an act of hostility, as a money-saving measure, it seemed to make perfect sense to say, OK, to keep Indian alliances intact means giving gifts as allies. These are the lubricants of Indian alliances. We don't need them as allies anymore, so let's cut off those gifts. Right? To Indian people, that was tantamount to an act of hostility. Because friends and allies gave and received gifts. It created obligation and tied ties. Once the British redcoats came in and occupied the forts and then started refusing those gifts, that reinforced in the Indians' mind that this was a real imperial threat. And there's a massive Indian, it's called a revolt, Pontiac's revolt. It's actually the first American war of independence, where Indians do 12 years before the American colonists <coughs> what the American colonists do in 1775. They take on the British Empire. And they push it back across the Appalachians. They destroy every British post west of the Appalachians, except Detroit, Niagara, and Fort Pitt. And at the and the war is ends not with a resounding British victory, but with the British negotiating peace with the Indians. The British realized they can't go on doing that. They need to have peace on the frontier, and the way to do that is to control and regulate the frontier. <coughs> How are you going to do that? Well, we need, to, well, we need to keep an army there. We're going to have to keep troops in North America. In America, as in Britain, there's a fear of a standing army. Right? Now the British are saying, we need to take the troops there. Why are we keeping the troops there? Well, to protect American colonists from the, from the Indians. Therefore, 
it's only fair that Americans should help support this, maintain this army through taxes. Right? That was one of Whitehall's smarter decisions, let's tax the American colonists. We all know where that went. But the other things the British, thing the British tried to do was to stop or to regulate settler expansion onto Indian land. And in October 1763, the British issued what was called the Royal Proclamation, and it established an imaginary boundary, basically running down the Appalachian Trail. It said, east of that, the crest of the Appalachian Mountains, that's British settlement, British territory. West of that, it's part of the British Empire, it's our territory, but it's Indian country. And settlers are not to go there willy-nilly, and Indian land will only be bought and sold by the representatives of the Crown in formal and open council with Indians, right? so that we will regulate trade, we will regulate settlement, <coughs> and we will cut down these bloody wars that will keep erupting. Right? Well, clearly it's a line that doesn't really exist. Right? It's incredibly difficult to enforce. They thought about building a wall, but they couldn't get the Indians to pay for it. <laughs> <coughs> and what happened is that American colonists, British subjects, settlers, just ignore it. They go and squat on Indian land. Sometimes the British troops would kick them out, and they just go back. It really has very little effect on you know, Scotch-Irish settlers, right? The Scotch-Irish people who'd left home to get away from the British government are not gonna listen to the British government's dictates 3,000 miles from home. But the people it does affect are people like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin and the Lee family in Virginia because these are people who, for a generation, have been speculating in Indian land west of the Appalachians on the assumption that once the French were defeated, it would be open season, that <clears throat> Anglo-American settlers would swarm over the mountains and be looking for land to buy, and the people who had that land, because they'd been out there early investing in it, would make a killing. And people like Washington, who are Virginia planters who are having a hard time, were relying on that, and now, they can't do that. It doesn't affect squatters and settlers, but it does affect people who are trying to sell land because now there's a cloud on the title because the British government is now saying only the British government, only the government can sell land. Right? And it's at that point that people like Washington and Jefferson begin to think, wouldn't it be a good idea to be independent from the British Empire? We talk, our textbooks talk about the taxes, they don't talk about this. So this is a picture that seemed to stare at me from every wall when I was down in, in Mount Vernon. You've all seen it, Emmanuel Lloyd's Washington crossing the Delaware. At that pivotal moment where the revolution looks like it's about to fail, and then this bold strike, he leads his, what's left of his army across the Delaware, defeats the Hessian forces at <coughs> Trenton. Princeton saves the revolution. A couple of things. This is Christmas Day. Christmas Eve, now this is a huge logistical, I would imagine, nightmare. This is a moment that's going to define not only whether the revolution lives or dies, but probably whether Washington lives or dies. The day before, he writes two letters that are really important. They're letters to Indians. Indians in Maine and Nova Scotia, talking about an alliance with them, how, it is impo how important it is to have them. So at the time when he's thinking about doing this, he's also thinking about relations with Indians because he knows how important they are. <clears throat> but Washington, this is one of those things that I think helps to establish Washington as a, such a heroic figure that he's almost, almost a demigod. Right? One of the reasons why I wanted to finish my book down at Mount Vernon was because having worked for a in a Native American Studies 
department for 25 years, I wanted to finish the book in George Washington's world, where I was exposed to people who sort of looked at me and what I was doing very kind of, hmm. As one guy said to me, you're not going to say anything bad about the general, are you? Right? <laughs> and I looked at him to see if he was kidding, and he wasn't. Right? Yeah. Because there are people who hold, revere Washington to such an extent that he's almost a, a god. Right? Well, I would suggest that if Washington is a god, the god that he most resembles is Janus, the Roman god Janus, the two-faced god. Right? Two-faced, not in the modern pejorative sense of the term, but um, looking in two directions, right? That's where January comes from, right? The, the, the month that looks to the old world, new year and the new year as Washington as the guy who looks to the future as well as looking to the past, but also looks in different directions, right? Here is crossing the Delaware, he's heading east. So much of the Washington story is about the east, so much of the revolution story and the creation of the nation is about the east, but Washington is looking west all the time, and he's looking west because that's where Indian land is. So the reason I call, think about the American Revolution and say the other revolution. There's two revolutions going on. One is a revolution in which the American colonies seek and achieve independence. The other is a revolution in which the American colonies seek and achieve access to Indian land. It's a revolution about freedom. It's also about a revolution about Indian land and who's going to get it. And for Indian people, the revolution is a war for their land, and it's also a war on their part for freedom against Americans. This is a sculpt, life-size sculpture in the National Museum of the American Indian in, Wa in Washington, D.C., and it depicts Washington, <coughs> an Ida chief, Scanandua, and an, an Ida woman called Polly Cooper, and you can see there's a bear down there. The bears are not actually there. They depict the clans of the, of the people represented. But this depicts an important moment in Oneida history where Oneida Indians, so the story goes, carried corn to Valley Forge to Washington's starving army and helped save the revolution. It doesn't get a lot of play in Washington's correspondence or in histories of the revolution, but it's, it's, it's crucial in uh, a NIDA sense of their nation's history. But for most of the revolution and for most of his dealings with the Iroquois, the Oneidas are one of the six nations of the Iroquois, Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondagas, Cayugas, Senecas, and Tuscaroras. For most of the revolution, Washington is fighting against Iroquois people, like the Mohawk war chief, Joseph Brown. He sends an army into Iroquois country in 1779 with <coughs> clear and repeated odd orders basically to burn out the Iroquois, to destroy them. <coughs> General John Sullivan, an attorney from New Hampshire, leads that army. It carries fire and sword through Iroquois country. He burns 40 Iroquois towns, estimates he destroys 160,000 bush bushels of corn, cuts down orchards, really devastates that whole region. It's called Sullivan's campaign. It's actually Washington's campaign. It's Washington's brainchild. He spends endless time planning for it, sending out questionnaires. He devotes more time to this campaign than I think any other campaign in the revolution. Right? Why? Well, one reason is that the Iroquois are raising hell and are attacking American settlements on the frontier, diverting resources <coughs> and uh, energies away from the war in the East. The other is to lay a claim to Iroquois land. When you read the <coughs> journals of the officers on that expedition, they are open-mouthed in wonderment that savages, as they call them, could produce such a cornucopia, orchards, cornfields that stretch for thousands of, of acres. Right? These guys are in the starting blocks when the war is over to get that land. But how do they know it's going to be American land? Right? 
Washington's war in the West against Indians is going on and actually is at its most bloody in 1782. That's the year after the British have surrendered at Yorktown. That's when the revolution is actually, to all intents and purposes in the East, over, but not in the West. And the reason is because we need to sort of rethink our American history. We know what happens, right? And we've all seen in our history textbooks those maps that show the original 13 colonies and then the United States in 1783. Right? The Peace of Paris, another Peace of Paris in 1783, the British recognized the independence of the United States and transferred to the United States all their territory south of the Great Lakes, north of Florida, and west as far as Mississippi, as the Mississippi River. It seems logical thing to do. It, it didn't necessarily need to go that way. As the war was winding down, European powers playing an intermediary role were suggesting, well, maybe we could fashion a peace settlement where basically people hold what they've got, which would have meant <coughs> the 13 original colonies would have gotten their independence, but they would have been kept east of the Appalachians. Right? Under the Quebec Act in 1774, the British had basically said the whole of the Ohio country is now going to be part of Quebec. Right? So it was not a foregone conclusion that when the United States got its independence, it would also get a huge territorial claim as far as the Mississippi. The way to make that claim solid was boots on the ground and to destroy Indian presence there and to claim that presence. And that's a very powerful incentive. So take a look at this map. The United States has won its <coughs> independence. And now you've got to try and get these 13 former colonies to think of themselves as a nation at a time when <coughs> not many people were interested in that. Right? You had to transform these United States, as they were described, into the United States. And that was a tussle. <clears throat> Federal authority, national authority had to mean something. And if you look at this map, <coughs> excuse me, you see the 13 original colonies, and then you see those land claims. Right? So look at Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia. Those states don't give up their land. Right? Once the th former colonies have become states and you've created the United States, what happens to those Western land claims? Right? Northern states tended to say, okay, this has to be a national resource. <clears throat> so we'll bequeath our Western land claims to the federal government. Southern states, not so much. Georgia does not cede its claims to Western land, Alabama, Mississippi, until 1802. So this is a tussle that Washington has to, to deal with. <clears throat> and so it means that in the early part of its existence, as the United States as a nation looks to expand westward, as a nation, the place it has to go is north and west of the Ohio River. Right? And in 1787, Congress passes a thing called the Northwest Ordinance, which is a brilliant, I think, because it does a couple of things. It commits the United States to Western expansion, but it also makes that Western expansion a bonding <coughs> experience. So if you think of the American Revolution, the people fought the revolution, Washington, Lee, Jefferson, Franklin. Right? These guys did not want to be thought of as radicals. So when they talked about the revolution, they talked about it as a kind of a natural thing. <coughs> the colonies were children of the mother country. But like children, they grew up, they became adolescents, they became a little unruly. <coughs> but then they went their own separate ways. Right? And it was natural and good that that should happen. 
Okay, fair enough. Trouble is now, what happens if Wisconsin starts to think the same way? Right? The people go live in Wisconsin say, well, we're kind of colonies of the United States, but now we've grown to maturity and maybe we don't need to be governed and ordered about by a distant government. Maybe we'll create our own nation. Right? And if that happens, what you get is not the United States, but lots of different republics being created across the nation. And lots of people thought that that's what the future landscape would look like. Not the United States, but a British North American empire, a Spanish North American empire, and different American kind of enclaves that places like Kentucky would have made a deal with Spain because that seemed like a better going concern. What the Northwest Ordinance does is say that an American territory, unlike a British colony, is a temporary situation. Unlike a British colony, which is always a British colony, an American temp uh, territory is a phase. Once the population reaches a certain number, you can set up a territorial government. Once the population reaches a certain number, 60,000, you can petition to join the United States as a state on an equal footing with all the other states. And it's brilliant. Right? And that is how most states in the United States enter the nation. Right? Well, of course, it's, a, it's a, an impressive measure, but it's also a commitment that the country is going to, the nation's going to grow by expanding and moving west onto Indian land. Article 3, I think, of the Northwest Ordinance says, we will always treat the <coughs> Indian inhabitants with justice and will never invade their territories except in just and lawful wars authorized by Congress. <laughs> Now, we all know enough about just and lawful wars authorized by Congress, but what the United States has done here has kind of created a situation, and I don't think this is just pure hypocrisy, right? in which it's committed to expansion on Indian land, but also committed to dealing fairly with Indian people. It's like expansion with honor. Can you do that? And it's one of the problems with American Indian policy leads its self open to hypocrisy all of the time. Uh, and it's one of the things that, that Washington wrestles with when he becomes president. <clears throat> because the Constitution of the United States gives the president and Congress control authority over Indian affairs, which means that Washington as first president has the opportunity <clears throat> to fashion an Indian policy for the new nation. And he's influenced and works hand in glove with this guy, Henry Knox, who is the first Secretary of War, because Indian Affairs is lodged in the War Department, right? which is an interesting place to put it, right? given that you're, you just said you'll only go to war with them in just lawful wars authorized by Congress. Right? <coughs> if Indian nations are nations, as Washington and Knox say they are, shouldn't they have been in the State Department? Right? But they're in the War Department until 1849, and then they are moved to the Department of the Interior, along with other resources. So it's a sort of strange situation. But Knox, as Secretary of War, there's a lot of bad stuff about this guy, but there's a lot of honorable stuff about this guy and Washington. And I've spent too much time wading through their letters to each other <coughs> to think that these two guys are just hypocritical and um, cynical about this. They both want to try and establish a policy, an Indian policy, for the new United States that will reflect honor of it on it in the eyes of the world, that will do justice to Indian people, and will get Indian land. Right? <laughs> you could see why they spend a lot of ink trying to work this out, because how do you do that? There is no question that Indians must give up the land. 
the United States at the end of the war for independence is like Britain was in 1763. It's, it's broke. It's got nothing. You know, no currency, no government, no you know, post office, no mint, etc. The only thing it has is that land, that territory, that Britain transferred to it. But that ter territory will only generate revenue once those Indian homelands can be transformed into American real estate and you can sell it to settlers and then it can begin to fill the coffers. Right? So it's a little bit like the United States is a shark, it, keeps, it has to be going forward. Otherwise it's just going to shrivel and die. It must and has to acquire Indian land. Knox understood that, Washington understood that, everybody understood that, Indians understood that. <coughs> and so they're wrestling with this all of the time. And actually Knox is pushing Washington saying we've got to do this right. We've got to treat Indians as nations. <coughs> we've got to do, deal with them justly. We will be judged by the rest of the world and by posterity in how we do this. And essentially what they come up with is a policy of making treaties and dealing with Indians diplomatically, which says it's better to buy land from Indians than it is to take it by war. It's also cheaper and it's the right thing to do. And so this is one of the reasons why there's so much diplomatic activity because better to deal with Indians peacefully than militarily. So this is a Creek Indian, his name is Hopothlimiko, it's, it's not Alexander McGillivray, but it is a Creek, a member of a Creek delegation that came to New York City in 1790 at a time when New York City was the capital, at Washington's invitation. He was trying to present, prevent all out war on the Georgia Creek frontier because Georgians, who hadn't given up their land claims, were encroaching on Creek territory. Creeks were not only killing them, but put, were making alliances with Spain to help resist them. And Washington needs to have peace with the Creeks. Why? Because the United States Army uh, at the end of the American Revolution is about 500 guys. They're at the arsenal in Springfield, West Point, and somewhere else, Har Harpers Ferry. Right? The Creek Confederacy, which spanned several states, could raise 5,000 warriors. Right? This is a major indigenous power. And so the Creeks are invited to uh, New York City. They're given military uniforms, that's an American officer's uniform, and they fashion a, a piece. An interesting incident that happens here, just to illustrate kind of the things that I'm talking about. When the Constitution says that the President can make treaties with the advice and consent of the Senate, so Washington and Knox say, okay, we're going to make a treaty with the Creeks, we're going to send commissioners down there to offer them terms, etc. Oh, we've got to advise and consent with the Senate. So they say, okay, we'll come to the Senate Saturday morning. And they walk over to the Senate to do this, because that's what the Constitution says you should do. And then chaos ensues, because nobody's done this before. So they walk into the Senate. Well, the president of the Senate is John Adams, who's the vice president. How does the president of the United States behave in the Senate? Where the, Senate, where the President of the Senate is somebody else. So there's an awkward shuffling about as they decide who's going to sit where. And then Washington has Knox hand John Adams the kind of treaty terms that he wants the Senate to advise and consent on, meaning he wants them to approve it. And we know all of this because there's an acerbic senator from Pennsylvania called McClay who hates Washington. He always refers to him as the greatest man in the world. Um, and he keeps this journal of what was going on. He says, first of all, Washington, Adams tries to read this and people say, no, wait a minute, we can't hear what you're saying because of the carts going past the windows. So they have to stop, close the shutters, <coughs> and then they start reading the terms again. 
and the senators kept saying, well, I don't know about this. I think we need to think about this. Let's establish a, it's like a Dartmouth faculty meeting <laughs> gone wrong, right? <laughs> Washington, as McClay says, has a violent threat. He says, this is not why I came here. And he storms out basically saying something like, I'll be damned if I ever come here again. He does come back on the Monday, they sort it all out. But presidents don't do that anymore. Right? And people, diplomatic historians who <coughs> have looked at this say, this is a huge development in, in the conduct of American foreign policy, where the president no longer goes to get advice and consent before he begins to make po foreign policy. He can sort of start it off, and then he gets the, the Senate to weigh in on it. So there are a lot of things like this that happen only because of Indians, or happen because of Indians at, at the time, and that's, that's one of them. So making, having peaceful relations with Indians, getting Indian people to give up their land peacefully, is the ideal. Right? You can do this bloodlessly, and Washington's optimistic about this. That's plan A. Right? What if Indians say, <clears throat> thanks but no thanks. Okay. Then you go to plan B. And plan B says if Indian people prove recalcitrant, if they refuse to accept the hand of the olive branch of peace and refuse to accept the reasonable terms that we're offering them from their land, then we will extirpate them. When I was down at Mount Vernon having to give talks, um, the director there used to joke with me and say, so what are you going to do when you come to genocide? He huh? said, I don't have to worry about it. I don't need to use the word genocide. I use Washington's word, extirpate. It means the same thing. You destroy these people entirely. Right? And that's the, the backup plan. And in 1791, the United States dispatches its army, its only army, into the Ohio country to defeat a confederacy of northwestern Indian tribes that has refused to sell any more land, that's resisting American expansion into that area of the country. And the Indian confederacy, led by Little Turtle of the Miami, this guy, looks harmlessly enough, right? um, Blue Jacket of the Shawnee, Bukungo Hills of the Delawares, not only defeats the army, but destroys it. It's like a mirror image of Braddock's defeat. Arthur St. Clair, this is the guy here, who was the governor of our Northwest Territory who led the army. His army is totally destroyed. A force of about 14,000 men, 900 casualties. November 1791, November 4th, 1794, one. The United States has no army. The British in Canada are just waiting for this experiment in republicanism to fail. The Spaniards are conspiring with southern Indian tribes, powerful Indian tribes <coughs> on its border. And the United States is essentially defenseless. It prompts the first congressional investigation in American history. And it prompts the United States and the people, American people to rethink about how they f organize, fund uh, their military. So that within three years, the United States is able to dispatch armies in, an army into Indian country and defeat them. But imagine, Thomas Jefferson said when the news of that disaster reached Philadelphia, nobody talked about anything else. Right? Imagine if President Obama had lost an army, right? had lost the army, you know, what the reaction would have been. I can no longer talk about what the reaction would be for the current administration, because who knows? But if Obama had done that? The infant United States, two years after the Constitution was ratified, is essentially defenseless. Right? That's why there's that flurry of Indian diplomacy, Indians coming to Philadelphia. Washington has to have them over for dinner because he can't send an army out to defeat them. He doesn't have an army. But in 1794, he manages to defeat them. And then he continues to conduct relations and diplomacy with Indian people. 
because Washington's formula for, for this exchange where Indians will give up their land, right? they have to get something in return. What are they going to get in return? This becomes a fundamental ingredient of American Indian policy. It's often attributed to Thomas Jefferson, but Washington articulates it. And that is, Indians must, will give up their land. We will take it peacefully, or we will take it by war, as they do. What will they get in return? They will get civilization. And this works because civilization to 18th century Americans and early 19th century Americans meant agriculture, a sedentary farming way of life. Right? Now, all of the Indian people that George Washington had to deal with, all of the Indian people <coughs> throughout the eastern United States were agricultural tribes. Right? They'd been farming for centuries. The problem was the wrong people were doing the farming. It was women who were doing the farming. Civilization required men to do the farming. And if you convert hunters to farmers, the idea is you reduce the amount of land that they need, because they don't need to go ranging all over the place hunting deer. They only need a plot of land and a plow, and so they can work it from dawn to dusk like American farmers. That means they'll have a lot of land left over that they don't need which the Americans want, and they will be only too happy to give. Right? That was the formula that Washington had. That was the formula that Jefferson applied, and it becomes a fundamental of American uh, Indian policy. This is no longer, I think, Benjamin Hawkins, who was Washington's Indian agent among the Creeks. Um, we're not quite sure who it is, but it shows the idea. Creek men laying their hands on a plow. Right? Creek settlement, not a village surrounded by fields, but dispersed homes. Right? Clans giving way to nuclear families. This was Washington's recipe for Indian people. And Indian people like, I had him out of line here, corn planter, who subscribed to this, if you like, bought into this, would be given a peace medal. Washington begins the practice of peace medals to Indian people. On the reverse of it, there's the eagle and shield, but here it shows George Washington and an Indian. The Indian has laid down his tomahawk. Washington still has his sword, but they're smoking the peace pipe, and back of them is a guy working a plow and a farmstead. Right? This is the future for Indians as Washington sees it, and this is a Seneca chief by the name of Red Jacket wearing one of these peace medals, right? showing that he is, if you like, a good Indian because he'd subscribed to that. <coughs> Washington fundamentally, I think, believed that the future of Indian people depended upon them becoming civilized, becoming like Americans. Right? And again, this becomes a a fundamental aspect of American foreign policy. You can see it playing out in the boarding schools in the late 19th century, where people I have to think of as being of, of good intentions do horrible things to Indian children because they believe that if they don't, those Indian children will have no chance in the new world that's coming. They have to lose their Indian identity, lose their Indian language, use, lose their Indian heritage, and become like Americans to have a chance to survive. Right? Washington is the first stages of, of that policy, I think. But at the same time, Washington had said that <clears throat> what we're dealing with are not tribes, but nations. We have to recognize that this is a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. And he established those relationships with Indian nations, and Indian nations continue to honor <coughs> and somewhere revere those relationships. This is a, a wampum belt. <coughs> and 
wampum is the marine shells woven into patterns, and they, um, that's a treaty, right? We're used to seeing written treaties, which we think Indians couldn't read. This is a treaty that we can't read, but Indian people could. It was their way of encoding it. <coughs> and this one actually is readable. It's called the George Washington Covenant Belt. It's one of the longest wampum belts in existence. It was commissioned by Washington, and it <coughs> uh, represents relations with the Haudenosaunee or Six Nations. So you count the figures on this, and you see these guys that look like football players. You count 13 of them. That's the 13 original colonies. And then there are two smaller figures standing next to a house. Who are they? <coughs> it's the six nations of the Iroquois. Well, there's only two of them. Well, that's right, because the guy on my left are the Mohawks, who are the keepers of the eastern door of the longhouse, the metaphorical longhouse, which is the Confederacy, and the Senecas of the Western Door. So the 13 original states are linking hands with the six nations through their Eastern and Western representatives. This, rep this uh, it represents the Treaty of Canandaigua in 1794, and that treaty is still honored to this day. The United States delivers cloth to the Seneca in particular, because this treaty said that it should. And I had a Seneca student in class, in, one, in my Indian treaties class a few years ago, who did her research paper on this treaty. She didn't know much about it, but she had a treaty blouse, a blouse that was made of pieces of cloth delivered on this. So this was supposed to represent a, uh, a bond of peace, right? as somebody said, a, a a bond of peace that was so strong and clear that it never needed to be polished. And I think that was Washington's aspiration. I think he hoped for that too. I also think that by the end of his life he realized the, the impossibility of achieving that. Right? Washington had some pretty horrible things to say about Indians, make me, no mistake. But he had some even worse things to talk about white people on the frontier. And these were the people whom he held primarily responsible for the bloodshed and the mayhem, etc. The problem, I think, is I call my book The Indian World of George Washington. Washington in Washington's Indian world was America's Indian world. Right? What he was wrestling with was perhaps trying to reconcile fundamentally irreconcilable goals. Nevertheless, let me skip over these guys. This is John Ross, principal chief of the Cherokees at the time of the Trail of Tears, the time of removal. He's actually seven-eighths Scottish, right? <clears throat> so he's kind of a relative, but he's 100% Cherokee because he acquires his clan membership in the bird clan through the female line. So it doesn't matter how many Scottish traders you've got in the woodpile, your Cherokee identity descends intact. Okay. Here is a guy who, as you can see, has changed according to circumstances. Washington's vision was that Indians would change and cease to be Indians. People like the Cherokees and lots of other people changed and continued to be Indian, right? found new ways to be Indian. Right? But what, the reason I show you this picture is because John Ross named one of his sons George Washington. And you may think, hmm, after all the things that Washington did, why would you do that? Right? Well, I think from Ross's point of view, the plan of survival that Washington envisioned and laid out for Indian people was one that he would have thought actually worked for the Cherokees. But you also have to take into account perspective. Right? He's principal chief of the Cherokees at the time when the Cherokees are dealing with the president who is Andrew Jackson, right? who is like the Saddam Hussein of Indian history. Right? 
from that perspective, looking back to a president who at least tried to have honorable and just dealings with Indian people must have seemed like looking back onto, onto a golden age. So enough. I'll give you time to uh, ask questions, howls of rebuttal, anything you like. Yes, sir. No. No. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was told to do that and I immediately for Oh, is it you? Yeah, you told me, didn't you? Okay. <laughs> Were Indians considered citizens as a result of the treaties? No. <clears throat> They're considered, it's a comp, I mean, it, what you raise is a really good question. When the United States creates a new nation, right, it's going to build an empire, what Jefferson calls an empire of liberty. And we tend not to think of an American empire, but it's an empire. It's not an empire like the British Empire. Right? Under the British Empire, as we saw, there's a place for Indians. It's not a very good place, but there's a place for you. Right? Under the American Empire, this is going to be an empire which expands westward, and an empire that's going to be different, an empire of liberty, because its, its citizens will share in the benefits and the fruits of that empire. But that then raises the question, who gets to be a citizen? Right? Do African Americans, do Native Americans, do women? Right? The answer, of course, is no. And that question of then raises, so if Indians are not citizens and they're not states, like the rest of the state, what is the place of American Indians in this new country that we've created? And Washington wrestles with that endlessly. Andrew Jackson doesn't. The Indian Removal Act of 1830, ethnic cleansing, right? move Indians out of the East. West. Basically answer that question, said there is no place for Indians. Right? But the whole citizenship question um, is complicated. It's not until 1924 that Congress passes the Indian Citizenship Act, whereby <coughs> all Indians become citizens. But of course, then that raises a question that some Indians said, no, you don't. We don't want to be citizens of the United States. We're citizens of our own nations. Right? Just because a foreign government says we're citizens doesn't mean we're citizens any more than if Mexico said we were citizens. Right? So it gets at these whole complicated questions of sovereignty. And I've heard people, you know, sovereignty is a huge deal in Native American studies today. And we talk about it all the time. And I've heard people say, oh, this is just 20th century. This is new inventions talking about, you know, tribal sovereignty and nationhood. And it's absolutely not. People are talking about it and in those terms all the time in the 18th century. And not just Indian people, but people like George Washington, because he recognized that. You know, what is going to be the status of Indian people? And his hope was <coughs> that, I don't think Washington for a minute <coughs> thought, believed, or wanted Indian tribes to survive as Indian tribes. Right? Because that's, that's a communal way of life, there's the different concepts of land ownership, etc. What he hoped, I think, was that the tribes would dissolve and individual Indian people would take their place in American society, and that would be the eventual path to citizenship. But that, too, becomes a, a, a fundamental part of American Indian policy. The United States government is trying to destroy Indian tribes in the Dawes Allotment Act in 1887, and maybe now as well. Yes. Is there any indicator to a what extent the natives understood our founding political philosophies? And so, what were their understandings of our philosophies? <coughs> is there any? Um, is there any indicator as to how, to what extent the natives understood our founding political philosophy of liberty and all that? Oh, absolutely. Um, the, because so I showed you a picture of Joseph Brandt earlier. Yeah, the question is, to what extent did Indian people, if at all, understood American political philosophy, the ideas of freedom, liberty, etc.? <clears throat> and I think the answer is, of, of course. What they, and I think what they did was understand it and find it wanting. And they, <clears throat> you don't have to go far into Indian history to see Native American responses to um, 
European and American claims to civilization, Christianity, freedom, liberty. Where Indian people say, I mean, especially Christianity is, is a drumbeat of um, responses where Indians say, so this Christianity thing, what, you know, what you're describing, yeah, that sounds fine. That's how we live now. The trouble we're having is we don't see you living that way. Right? <laughs> and you get some of the same things with, it, with, with freedom and liberty. The Indian people saying, what you're talking about is freedom. We don't see that as freedom. And it certainly doesn't look like freedom for us. What looks like freedom for you seems to entail the freedom to take our land and make slaves of us. Right? And so they, very often you get this debate. Let me just show you this. I, wasn't, I skipped over this because I was going on too long. Famous painting, <coughs> the death of uh, General Montgomery at <coughs> uh, Itacum, <coughs> excuse me, during the invasion of Canada at the beginning of the American Revolution. I have this in the book, and I have it in the book because it's a colorful, dramatic 18th century picture, but I have it in the book because of this guy. There's an Indian there waving a tomahawk. I don't think there was an Indian there waving a tomahawk, but it's one of the things you drop into Indian, into portraits. It's this guy. He is Abenaki, an Abenaki mother, an African-American father, and an adopted Mohawk. He becomes known as Louis Cook. Washington knows him well. He's the highest commissioned officer in the American army. Washington has lots of dealings with him. Um, he invites him around for dinner places. This is a, a real interesting guy. And I actually use a quote from him at the end of the book because he talks about freedom. He talks about the American ideal of freedom and how what you talk about as freedom for you people is not freedom for us. And here you have a Native American, African American man articulating those critiques very effectively. And he's not the only one. So Joseph Brandt that I showed you earlier along, um, when I was doing my PhD research in, in England and wading through the letters of the British Indian Department, I used to love seeing a Joseph Brandt letter come. Because Joseph Brandt was a Mohawk, but he was educated by Eliezer Wheelock, not at Dartmouth, but at the previous school. So his handwriting was clear and legible. Right. Most of the guys in the British Indian Department were Scots, Irish guys who were, you know, scribbling by candlelight if they were sober and you, you know, <laughs> Joseph Brown. So when we, there were many Indian people in the 18th century. There were Indian people who were literate, there were Indian people who were educated, but Native American people regularly debate <coughs> on these issues of freedom and what it means. And because for them, this is fundamental when what they are fighting for all the time is their freedom, which means the freedom to live their own way of life, to protect their homelands, all of those kinds of things. And they understand fundamentally that American expansion is, and the growth of the American nation is predicated upon taking away their land, which in Washington's formula also means taking away their way of life. Right? because you have to reduce Indian people from hunters to farmers so that you can justify and facilitate the removal of their land. So they understand this. Uh, and it's, I think, you, you find far more of that point-by-point um, -point debate than one would think or than one would expect um, because we're so accustomed to this idea of in Indians being sort of gullible, innocent victims. Um, they very quickly know what's going on, I think. Um, do you think uh, Louis Cook ever had, had dinner or breakfast? You know? No, the reason I put that in was because Linda Cook said she was going to come to the talk. But you know where he does have? You know where he does have dinner? Is over <coughs> in the Hudson Valley. There's, a, there's an Italian 
he has an Italian count <coughs> traveling, and he stops for dinner. I think it's at the Livingston Manor, and there's Livingston there. I think Henry Knox is there, and uh, Washington, a few other big names. And he doesn't name him by name, but he says there's a, <coughs> this Indian colonel who speaks perfect French, right? And Cook went down to meet Rochambeau uh, down in, I think it was in, in Newport, <coughs> and Rochambeau said the same thing. This guy's fluent in French. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if he had dinner in Norwich, but he had dinner lots of places. He was, you know, he was that kind of guy. Somebody, else? yeah. Uh, so. Before the revolution, before the formation of the United States as a country, did any of the colonies <coughs> have what might be called an Indian policy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The question is, before the formation of the United States, did any of the colonies have an Indian policy? It's a great question, and the answer is yes. They all had their own. So it was chaos. So one of the reasons why at the end of the French and Indian War, the British <coughs> ran that proclamation line, what they were also doing is saying, we can't have all these colonies conducting their own Indian policies. The Indian policies have to be conducted centrally from London so that we can operate with a consistent imperial vision rather than having Georgia doing its thing and North Carolina doing its thing and Pennsylvania doing this, this thing. And then, of course, <coughs> when the United States emerges as a nation, it does the same thing. So Washington had screamed bloody murder about the Royal Proclamation, which did two things. It said, <coughs> Nobody goes into Indian country to trade without a license from central government, and nobody buys Indian land without the approval of the central government. In 1790, Congress passes the Indian Trade and Intercourse Act, which says nobody trades in Indian country without a license, and no transfers of Indian land are legal without approval of Congress. Right? Exactly the same thing. What Washington has done has inherited the same mess because the states are no more willing to give up their Indian policies than were the colonies. So while Washington's trying to forge a national government with a national Indian policy, New York's pulling off treaties, um, other you know, varieties. And this comes back to bite in, uh, in the 20th century. In Maine, for instance, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy's in this, um, 60s and 70s, uh, look at the situation, say, how come we, we used to occupy, used to have almost the whole of Maine for our homeland, and now we've got these tiny little reservations? And they and their <coughs> attorney look back and say, well, there are these treaties. You've got treaties with Massachusetts, and then, which used to be Maine, Massachusetts and the state of Maine. Okay, so you gave up all your lands on treaties. When were those treaties made? Well, they were made in the 1790s and the early 80s. They were made after the Indian Trade and Intercourse Act. Well, let's just go and let's just look and see if those treaties and those land sales were approved by Congress. Well, of course they weren't, because nobody paid any attention to Congress then. It's like now. <laughs> and so those treaties were illegal. And so they and say, oh, okay, well, we'll have our land back. Right? <laughs> wow. If you look, you can see, I think there's a New York Times <clears throat> from 1980 with President Jimmy Carter with an eagle pen signing the Maine Indian Land Claim Settlement, which was they had to pull together to sort all this out. Right? And it goes back to that time. But that's one of the things that's going on. We, we tend to think, when I say we, I mean me, we depict Indian history as, you know, this sort of mon... We, we say, oh, the tribe... Native America's complex and varied. There's all this multiplicity. So, and sometimes we then fall into the trap of what we're just dealing with white people, right, or an imperial power. But both the British in their dealings with the colonies and then the United States national government in dealing with its states, it's like a um, kaleidoscope. You know, it's all changing all the time. And lots of times, the colonies are undermining the British imperial policies, and the states are undermining American national policies. It's, it's, it's chaos. It's a mess. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.